tonight I'm going to give you a different way of approaching some of the most fundamental parts of any spiritual journey. Starting with, what does it mean to be conscious? Like we're on this spiritual journey. We're all waking up in consciousness. We're all trying to bring more consciousness into our lives, right? We might call it working on ourselves, right? You get that really deep spiritual impulse and that's, that becomes your focus. Like someone says, what are you doing? I'm working on myself. What does that actually mean? It's important to actually know. What does it mean to become conscious? And what does it actually mean to be unconscious? What do these words actually mean? Because they don't mean what you may think they mean. What does it mean to become conscious? Well, I'll tell you what, what the misunderstanding is. A lot of people think becoming conscious means becoming conscious of certain spiritual concepts. Like, I realized all is one, we're all interconnected, love is the highest power. These are all true statements. But that's not actually what you're here to become conscious of. What you're here to become conscious of is the very thing that unconsciousness is designed to avoid at every turn. So if you know the very thing that unconsciousness has to run away from, because if unconsciousness faces consciousness, it disappears. So unconsciousness is running for its life, trying to stay intact. What is unconsciousness avoiding? Your ability to change. When you become conscious, you become aware of the changes that are necessary to be made in your life to become the most mature version of yourself. And it gets very mesmerizing because the ego likes to embrace choices based on the idea that if I change, I'm going to get more of what I want. And what scares the ego to death is the news briefing that says, you have to change with no guarantee that it's going to give you what you're hoping for. And the ego says, I don't know if I buy that. And the good news is, is that the ego doesn't have to. Whether in the aftermath of tragedy, whether at the brink of despair, whether it seems like your life circumstances have been flipped upside down over the years or suddenly, it will inspire a level of adversity that is simply life's invitation to say, now it is time to change for the better. And through the eyes of the universe, when we are totally aligned with the maturity of awakened consciousness, we are changing not because it's going to give us what we want. We're changing because the ultimate thrill ride in a human body is to experience your consciousness in a body of senses at its highest level of maturity. When you experience your consciousness at your highest level of maturity, it creates an experience called bliss. We all want bliss. I say that and we go, ooh, I would like that, right? As I said that, we all went, add to cart. <laughs> yes, now. Amazon Prime one-click purchase. I'll take bliss right now. And in, and, but then the interesting thing is we all want bliss, but are we willing to take the journey that gets us there? And when we are, it's a one-sided transaction that says you have to be willing to change whether or not it gives you what you want. And that's what unconsciousness is fighting. It will only change if, it guarant if it's guaranteed to get what it wants. 
if it guarantees the soulmate, if it guarantees a new bank account, a different life purpose, if it can guarantee that the ego can be someone else, go somewhere else, or do something else, then the ego embraces that as a moment of reinvention. But true spiritual awakening is you will realize in order for you to grow into your highest level of maturity, there will be changes that will be made in your reality. You will experience yourself as a different version of yourself as you bring your highest wisdom into your beingness, and then it will ripple out into your life. And there will be no guarantee that it will give you any of the things that you're waiting and hoping to attract and manifest. That's the deal life will give you. And the best case scenario is for you to say yes and not even try to find the fine print to read. When I was a child, I first discovered spirituality in a very unexplainable, in a very interesting way. I was introduced to spirituality through religion and just becoming aware of God. And in religion, it's very much like this character, God. And I wasn't really resonating with religion, but this thing called God or this light in the sky, you know, it, it captivated me. And when I was a very young child, and I didn't understand why I did this until I was an adult, the moment I discovered God, not a religious God, but the light of unconditional love dwelling in all of us. Instantaneously, when I discovered the reality of source, I handed my entire life over to it. No questions asked. I was like eight. And I didn't even know what I was doing. It just felt right. And each and every one of us will have this impulse awakening inside of us where we get to have the hand of God, metaphorically, come through the sky to reach out to you in your deepest moment of despair, where the hand of God is saying to you, I'm not ruining your life, I'm cracking you open. And I'm cracking you open to bring you out of your hiding spot so that you no longer find comfort in playing so small. And I will reach my cosmic hand out to you. I will carry you through every moment. But you have to let me lead the way. And I give you no guarantees. And when something inside of us says yes to that, that's when we're ready for the mature path. The mature journey that says Whatever I learn along the way is worth more than trying to keep things the way they are. And what will happen is it's either going to be spontaneously awakening inside of you, or for some of us, it's this grind of taking so much of your energy and trying to hold your life together with the fear of, if I don't hold it all together, it's all going to fall apart. And sooner or later, you're going to have this really interesting evil Knievel impulse in your heart that will say, if I need to hold all this together, it's never meant to be the way I think it needs to be. What if I just let go and see what happens? What if I step into the unknown? What if I become the one who changes and not holding my breath waiting for others to make a shift? Someone once asked me, they said, you're an empathic being. You feel everyone's energy. How come you don't get bombarded by it? I said, because I'm only under, I'm under the impression that I'm the only one who needs to change ever. And when you are constantly willing to not just work on yourself, like you're digging and digging and digging and put yourself under a microscope and bullying yourself and treating, treating your soul like an energetic cadaver, 
and cutting herself apart. Ooh, what's that? Ooh, why is that there? Ooh, what's that? That doesn't look right. <laughs> when you know that your body is the holy vessel of an awakening soul, could there be anything more subtly blasphemous? But just poking and prodding at your own God body? What's this? Why is that there? That doesn't look right. Ew. Ew. Ooh, is, that, is that my ego? I don't like that. Ooh, let's dig underneath it. What do we find there? That's why the spiritual path I lead, the love revolution, is about we transform by loving ourselves, not micromanaging ourselves. Because life is hard enough. Life is uncertain enough. Life, you're on the highest spiritual journey known to mankind, and you've been brought here to complete that with little to no instructions. That's hard enough. <laughs> At least an IKEA table comes with instructions. I mean, it's not going to be in the language you speak, but still. <laughs> you know? At least there's some guidance. I mean, think of how crazy that is. We are on a spiritual journey, and the instructions on the spiritual journey are only the little breadcrumbs you get by living it. It's, an, it's on an as-needed-to-know basis. You only know exactly what you need to know the moment you need to know it. And what will help you wake up is when you realize not the questions are wrong, tomorrow we're going to answer a lot of questions. We have our chair for questions. But what you'll realize is that the questions you have primarily, the pattern of repetitive questions, is that all your questions are either about something that isn't happening right now or not relevant to what you need to know right now. It's like in the ego, we go, I can't be safe, I can't feel relaxed until I know this. And the truth is, most of us have questions about the very things we don't need to know. So, if, so as a, just a funny way of creating a shift in your mind, if you have a question, and by the way, we all know you're going to ask the question. <laughs> That's what tomorrow's for. I welcome questions. But just know that if you can make it into a question, it confirms exactly what you don't need to know right now. <laughs> Do, has, have you ever realized that? Because if you sit with questions long enough, you'll see it very clearly. Wow, my curiosity, and, and curiosity is a beautiful energy, but what does it do? Curiosity, when it's not tamed and surrendered, is an energy that pulls you out of yourself. And it goes, I need to know all of this. But you realize, over years of watching this, everything I ask has nothing to do with the moment I'm in. And when you realize that, do you know what vanishes in that moment? Your ego. And all of a sudden, you're no longer someone that needs to be coddled and protected. And you come out of your smallness and you come into who you really are. You are clarity. That's your true nature. You are clarity. And the only reason why you don't know that you are clarity is because you're ma mesmerized by the fascinations of questions that only keep you perceiving from a lens of deficiency. And that's what you wake up out of. You wake up out of the belief in deficiency and you realize that your perception of worthiness and abundance is the after effect of how willing to change you become. And I don't know where this thing got mixed up, where our willingness to change means that we're judging ourselves, or to accept ourselves means we shouldn't have to change. Like, oh, no, no, Matt, I don't change anymore. I just accept myself as I am. Well, that's horrifying. <laughs> because we all should be willing to change. In fact, real acceptance is accepting that change is needed. 
I remember I was talking to someone and I was doing a dialogue and they say to me, Matt, I feel like you're just trying to change me. And I said, well, now we're both in on this. Thank you. I am trying to change you for the better. I said, well, I don't think I need to change. I said, you should talk to your partner and your family. Because you might find a different opinion. Real acceptance knows when to change. And change doesn't mean that we have to judge ourselves as I failed, I've done something wrong. It's just a very simple thing that when in your life, for whatever reason, when shit hits the fan, that's life's way of saying, now you're being prepared to change for the better. It's just a seasonal thing. And we have to just get on to the fact that, oh, my life is falling apart. I'm becoming a newer version of myself. What are the changes that I can make to make my life more of a reflection of my highest wisdom and maturity? And all that's going to kick and scream inside of you that we lovingly call unconsciousness or the ego or your conditioning are the parts of you that cannot survive outside of the energy of your most immature impulses. That's all darkness is, is the gravity of our immature behavior. And the more often we keep choosing it, the more powerful it seems to be. And the awakening of consciousness is handing over your will to your highest maturity, knowing there is no way you will ever find true happiness by avoiding the maturity waking up inside of you. And in the beginning, it will seem like, oh, this isn't fun, this isn't fair, why me? All the same things that people going through the first initial stages of rehab say about having to go clean. Awakening is spiritual sobriety. And you're waking up out of the impulse of ego. And so there's all these interesting things that arise, and that's why we love ourselves, because we love those parts. We love the parts that refuse to change. We love the parts that only know how to be nourished by our most immature patterns of instant gratification. We love the parts of ourselves that want everyone to change and can tell everyone else how they should change, but will never lead by example. <laughs> Maybe you know someone in that situation. <laughs> Maybe you saw it on TV, I don't know. Not us, Encinitas. No, 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 they're all in Carl's bed right now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Not Carl's bed. Because <laughs> Carl's bed is home to my favorite restaurant, did you know that? Campfire. That's my church. <laughs> I was there last night. All I'm going to say is, try the broccoli dish. That's all I'm going to say. I would fly around the world for that dish. That's all I'm going to say. So when we're working on ourselves, what we're really doing is we're becoming aware of all the forces within us that motivate us to act immaturely, to think immaturely, to speak immaturely, to respond immaturely to other people. And it's, be it's becoming aware of how often your youngest inner child or adolescent takes the wheel of adulthood. And if we're working on ourselves, we're just identifying and loosening the grip of these most limiting beliefs that keep us believing that our deepest sense of nourishment comes through instant gratification. And what we find that is contrary to a world, a world that is steeped in a belief of deficiency, 
and always looks for instant gratification. And with the acceleration of technology, we now just have instant gratification becoming more instant and downloadable. Right? Ten years ago, you'd watch someone who's at a stoplight waiting for a train to pass, getting impatient and flipping out. Now we have people who flip out if, they, if the song they downloaded doesn't download in half a second. And what we realize when we wake up, contrary to societal imprinting, is that the more often we nourish ourselves with instant gratification, the more deficient we feel. And the more we learn to go without the impulses of instant gratification, the more abundant and sufficient we feel, the more harmony we feel. We wound up getting a lot more out of having less. And it's completely contradictory to the story that the society is telling you, which is not the truth, it's just the truth of society's marketing campaign. And we see it all the time, limited time offer. Oh, you wanna feel better? You need this, Snickers, it satisfies. Or whatever else. And what we're waking up to is that our most immature impulses and the parts of us that are capable of doing great harm to ourselves and others is perpetuated by the constant pattern of feeding deficiencies with instant gratification. And as we learn to empty out, feel those impulses, whether it's emotional eating, whether it's habitual dating, impulse shopping, for some it might be pornography, all sorts of things that energetically just make the hunger of unconsciousness more hungry as we allow those impulses to detoxify we actually become different versions of ourselves and the scary thing for your ego is that you start wanting different things desiring different things and there's a part of you that goes i can't believe i don't want what i always desired and it's like an identity crisis the ego goes through. But what's happening is that your ego is horrified by the fact that you're no longer craving the things that keep you deficient. And as you come into a dimension of sufficiency, empowerment, consciousness, and light, you start craving only the things that are good for you. It's a really good thing, but it horrifies the unconsciousness dissolving within you. So we just have to be aware of the fact that as we go through this evolutionary process from unconscious to conscious, it literally can be distilled into words that say, you're going through a transformation so you can start craving only the things that are good for you. And that is giving an identity crisis to the parts of you that have learned to be fed and nourished by less redeemable forces. That's what awakening will do to you. It will make you crave things that are good for you. And that's amazing. And then you'll sit there and you'll go, I can't believe I don't like this thing anymore. Let me just make sure. <laughs> I mean, if I really don't like it, I mean, right? Let me just make sure I don't like it. I mean, this is my field research. Let me just make sure. The light of heaven is always here to connect with. And the light of divinity says, come on in. Come on in. Stay as long as you want. And we come in. We get fed. We get replenished. We get our tank refilled, and then we often leave and go back to the play. And the universe just smiles. Because awakening is the moment you go back and you connect with the light, and you don't leave.
and you stay right there in the light of wholeness. So in order for me to inspire you, because here's the funny thing about what I do. I do what I call a lot of backdoor teachings, which is I just shared with you that consciousness is about the willingness to change. But I'm not up here saying you should change. What I'm going to do is take the backdoor approach to where you will leave tonight excited about change that I didn't tell you you should do. Because if I can give you a deeper experience of wholeness, if I can spend the rest of my time with you tonight escorting you out of deficiency, then what's going to happen is you're going to change your relationship with change and you're going to want to be excited for, you're going to be excited for change instead of intimidated by it. We only resist change because we don't understand it's the only thing we came here to do. We came here to change. And when you get good at changing and transforming and aligning with the choices that are the most beneficial for you is the moment in your awakening process where nothing more needs to change at all. So let's, let's wake up out of deficiency together. Let's wake up to wholeness. And let's step into a new spiritual dimension by stepping out of the old paradigm. A paradigm that was all about clarity, but still vibrating at the level of deficiency. For example, how many questions that you personally have that you would ask of the universe or me or anyone else. How many questions remain when it's not of the theme of what's wrong with me or what's wrong with them? <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? Because what's wrong with me is a belief in deficiency. And the question will take you on an unfair journey because they say, what's wrong with me? Then you start thinking of possibilities of what might possibly be wrong with you. But if there's nothing wrong with you, you're going to be thinking in the wrong direction. And then when you get sick and tired of thinking what's wrong with you, you take a coffee break and you spend time thinking, well, what's wrong with them? <laughs> How many questions legitimately remain inside your consciousness when it's not steeped in what's wrong with me, what's wrong with them? Even when deficiency masquerades as, why are the things I want not showing up so fast? Do you want, you want the answer? I'll give you the enlightened answer to that question. The reason why things are not showing up fast, as fast as you want them to, because it's not time for that to happen yet. <laughs> and you say, but I want it to happen. I want it to happen. And oftentimes, wanting something to happen is a confirmation that it's going to happen somewhere up ahead. But oftentimes, when we want it the most, we're the least ready to receive it. So we don't manifest what we want as fast as we want it, because it's the wanting that needs to be buffed out and matured so that you can receive what you desire. And for a lot of people, what they do is they go, if I haven't manifested what I want, then that's the living proof of what's wrong with me. Right? The fantasy of if I'm a truly awakened soul, I should be able to manifest, snap my fingers, and it instantly shows up. Do you want to know why we think that? Because in heaven, that's how things work. You think it, it manifests instantaneously. And on some level, you remember being able to create like that. But imagine you're in heaven manifesting instantaneously. Now, the first time you do this, that is amazing. You won't even believe it. You'd be like, oh my God, I want to pet a pony. Boom, <laughs> there's a pony. Like, how did I do that? How did I do that? 
And of course, the pony's thinking, you did, and I manifested you. <laughs> and in heaven, you do this enough times, and you can't believe it. You go, okay, I want to see a rainbow. Bloop. Rainbow. Shooting star. There you go. And after enough times in heaven, manifesting your desires makes desire not that big of a deal. And then what starts to become more of a fantasy is this idea of what if I incarnate into the part of heaven called earth, where there's something called time. Where instead of manifesting instantaneously, because what does instantaneous manifestation rob you of? A journey. We came here in this sector, in this gated community of heaven. <laughs> the gangster level. The artist community. Right? Angels don't judge Earth. They just go, no, no, that's just the part that's up and coming. <laughs> we come here because time is the gift of incarnation. With time, you have something called a journey where things that you desired in heaven and things that you want to manifest will deliberately take a lot of time to show up. And by it taking a lot of time, you get to examine the limiting beliefs you have about yourself, about reality, and any grudge you have against the universe unknowingly. And to step into your highest potential, and then things will show up when there's not so much desire juice around. And once it shows up, you're ready to receive it and handle it and not objectify it. Because that's what human beings do, is they desire objects that represent the false promise of how they hope to feel. Someone says, I want this in X, Y, and Z. Just like a kid would ask Santa Claus. Because we want all these new things because we think this new thing, this new collection of objects, whether it's a bigger bank account, a different partner, a different career. These are, all relative, these are all very valid things. But we want these things because we think that once I have these things, I'm going to feel better. And what we realize is that how we want to feel and the things that we desire have no relationship in reality. It's a creation of your own mind. And what prevents you from manifesting instantaneously is the belief that the things you desire will make you feel better. So, and a lot of you know I do these repeat after me things to help you get the energy in your body. Just try these words out loud and let's see if you can get onto the cosmic joke. <laughs> if I had right now, I had right now all, that I desire, all that I desire, I'd feel no different. Do you know what we call that? Truth. <laughs> You'd feel no different. No different whatsoever. That's why people have midlife crises. They look at their beautiful partner. They're sitting in their beautiful home. They're waxing their beautiful car. And they go, come on. <laughs> Do something. And what life is trying to teach us is, oh, no, 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 no. Like, you could have anything you want. And you will actually attract it faster if you have no reason for it. Like, if you literally say, universe, please bring me this for no reason at all. It won't make me happier. But I'd love to have it now, thanks. <laughs> Try it. You'll be surprised how fast things show up. It's amazing. It's amazing. Universe, please bring me a partner to verify how not any more happy I'll be. <laughs> Thanks. 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 Because happiness, happiness is the perfume of awakening spiritual maturity.
Happiness is only the residue that we feel in our hearts and radiate to others when doing the right thing and coming from the highest perspective and choosing the high road is not an option, but a necessity. And from the space I live in and how I greet you when I'm not on stage with you, the high road is not an option for me. It is a necessity. In every moment, every day, I only have one measurement of success, and that is being the most polite and loving person to everyone I meet, and I have no concern with their attitude or state of consciousness. No concern for it whatsoever, because I am living in a game that only I am playing. That's where we get to, and that's where power is. That's where true power is because instead of trying to get other people to change and be the way you need them to be, it's all about what am I willing to do differently in myself? What am I asking of them? Can I give that to myself? Can I become more autonomous? Can I become more self-sustaining? Can I dissolve every argument I'm having with others and seeing that if I'm arguing with others, I'm only fighting with the reality of life within me. And that helps us become conscious of people when they're being unconscious. Because people are never arguing with you, they're arguing with life. And they don't know they're arguing with life because they're making it about you. And you may not know you're arguing with life when you're making it about others. And what we're arguing with life about is the very gift we came here for, time. Why is this taking such a long time? Why? Can't I just download an app? Isn't there like an awakening app I can download and push a button? Can't Siri wake me up? Can I send Siri to a Reiki certification course? Let her just zap energy through my phone? Why is it taking such a long time? Because this is what we wanted. We wanted time. Because in heaven there is no time. It's instant. And after a while, instant is boring. <laughs> Think about that. How miraculous of a reality is heaven where after a while you can manifest instantaneously and it makes you yawn. And all of a sudden, then, the ability to incarnate into a body and be a specific, unique set of attributes and the ability to go from one level of consciousness to the next and to actually have the power and will to change and to decide how much of your absolute potential you get to embody in this form and then you radiate that out to watch how it transforms an entire world, that's the game we're playing. And so this is about being excited to change. And so... The excitement of change comes out of waking up out of deficiency. Again, nothing wrong with you. You're going through an evolutionary process that you don't understand. And no matter how much you've read about the subject matter, it will always be just beyond your understanding. And we learn to trust what can't be understood because that's the journey of surrender. There's nothing wrong with others. They're going through a process they don't understand. Just for a moment, what does it feel like in your body? And you will have all these different defenses in your mind. You'll have all these different <sighs> feedback mechanisms that will try to use every example to disagree with me. But just to go beyond that, what is it like right now, in this moment, if nothing was wrong with you or anyone else? Let's allow this moment to, let's allow this room to be reality. Let's make this room our world. So bringing up examples of things that are not happening in this room is futile. But when people talk about this, they go, oh, well, let's talk about all the horrors of the world. In this moment, there are no horrors right now happening. And there are horrors in this world that will be resolved, and we are helping to resolve it energetically by being in a space beyond 
those fixations. But what is it like in this moment? This is our world. This room is earth. This is the world. Nothing wrong with you. Nothing wrong with anyone else. What does that feel like when nothing is wrong? And some of you will feel, oh, that feels really good. And then the immediate control will be, how do I, how do I make this happen all the time? <laughs> how do I? Ooh, how do I control this? How do I covet it? How do I, how do I, how do I brand this? How do I monetize this? <laughs> I'm going to monetize this state of consciousness. <sighs> or, if your ego is really being affected by this, it will actually confuse you. How do I live now? How do I live with nothing wrong with me? <laughs> the real question is, how the hell did all of us make it this far? <laughs> Thinking things are wrong with us and other people. Like, and that also lets you know, some people go, I don't hear my angels talking. Do you know why? They're too busy keeping you alive. <laughs> we are all hallucinating something's wrong. <laughs> and your angels are trying to keep you out of oncoming traffic. They are busy. They're trying to keep you clothed. Like, how do we function? When you wake up, you, you ask the question, God, how did I function like that? Because when you're asleep, there's always something wrong. My parents were lovely human beings. I love them. I have a great relationship with them. They've crossed over. We've had many conversations. They're awesome. But in my parents' life, there wasn't a day that went by where something wasn't wrong. And then if I was too quiet, my mom would go, honey, what's wrong? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> honey, I know you. You're being very quiet. I would say, mom, I'm, I'm watching TV. <laughs> I have to be quiet because if I'm not quiet, I can't hear them. They're making noise. I want to hear it. So I got to not say anything. <laughs> Something's wrong. Definitely. Then she put her hand on my head. All of a sudden, my mom's now a nurse practitioner. <laughs> you feel warm, Matthew. I think you're coming down with something. Really? <laughs> and this funny thing that we all experience is because when we're in the presence of unconsciousness, and I say this lovingly, unconsciousness does not know how to show care without concern. In unconsciousness, care comes as the resolve of some form of concern, which means someone has to see you from a state of limitation to then be able to act as your rescuer. Does <laughs> that go a little deeper? Oh my god, I think I do that. Oh my god. Oh shit, I do that. <laughs> That's the noise of, of, of clarity. It's your stomach getting a little barfy. <laughs> Ooh, I felt that one. And when you're conscious, when you're conscious, Care replaces concern. You don't have to be concerned. You can just care. Care comes from thoughtfulness, not from concern. Thoughtfulness is a, vi is a vibration of mindfulness. Concern is a frequency of fear. And in a subtle way, we worry about people so that we can then be their rescuer because secretly, we don't know how to have purpose and value in other people's lives unless they're in need of being rescued. Like when I became an adult, my mom went through this existential crisis of, I don't know how to be, to feel valuable as your mother if I'm not the one always saving you and building you up and rescuing you. 
When we become conscious, we just care without the need or threat of concern. Feel what that would be like to just care without the need to worry, to fear, to be concerned, to see other people in states of limitation. Imagine being with a friend and saying, I empathize with your experience, but I politely disagree with your viewpoint because I refuse to see you that small. As your friend, I will not see you that small. I understand why you feel that way, and I will be here to love you. But I can't agree respectfully, because I can't see you that small. I just know you to be so big. And I'll hold space for you to join me in this bigness, but I can't join you in your smallness. I will care, but I don't need concern in order to open my heart and love you. That's consciousness. Feel that. What would this moment be like if you allowed yourself, and I say allowed because you have this choice, and maybe it's a choice you're not aware of. What would this moment be like if you weren't concerned about anything? Again, this is our world. What's there to be concerned about? And you know what's even more ironic? We live in a world right now, outside these doors, where we have someone in the presidential office acting his natural self, which is completely ridiculous. I mean, how out there do you have to behave to where I can say ridiculous and it's actually literal and not judgmental. <laughs> I mean, we have a president who is publicly saying racist. All, check all the boxes. And you know why we as a people haven't had a little powwow and went, uh, uh, uh. We will not stand for this. Absolutely not. Do you know why we haven't done that? Because we're all too stuck in concern. He plays the perfect character to do all the wacky things to give you a reason to be concerned. We're at a place where we either justify our concern or we wake the fuck up. Because we've all been in this unconscious state of deficiency and concern and fear. And all we have now is tangible evidence to make that dimension more concrete. And then if you wake up out of that reality and become the light of consciousness that will transform the world for the better for everyone, people will say, oh, no, you're not looking at reality. You're bypassing. You're avoiding. Reality is in such a weird position right now where we literally have two different, generally two different realities. Quantumly, on a quantum level, way more than that. But let's just talk about the idea that there are two basic realities. There's a reality where everything that is negative, limited, and deficient is so real that everywhere you look, if you're aligned with that energy, you'll find nothing but evidence. Then we have another dimension where everything of wholeness, sufficiency, empowerment, and light is as real as real can be. 
And if you're aligned in that, you'll see nothing but evidence of that. And these two realities are coexisting. And you have to choose which one you wish to be a part of. And the illusion is thinking there's only one reality. But how can there be only one reality when we all are having different experiences? In fact, every single one of us are living in our own parallel dimension. In fact, just to make it more wacky and wild, when a par parallel dimension means that things are existing in a multiplicity of timelines, differently based on levels of consciousness. When a parallel dimension manifests in reality, do you know what it takes shape and form as? A human body. Every single one of you are your own parallel dimensions, and reality is the space where parallel dimensions meet and interact and uplevel each other. So we all think we're all living in the same world, we're all sharing space together, but we're all in our own worlds. And you have to actually decide there's going to be complete concrete proof of limitation and complete concrete proof of transcendent glory. You have to choose which one you want to be a part of. And what you see on the outside is just giving you tangible proof of what vibrationally you've been conditioned to perceive and believe. And that's why I'm helping you wake up out of deficiency to move you into the other world. And we're not leaving anyone behind. We're not ignoring. We're not pretending things aren't happening. We're accepting that things are only happening to bring an entire world into the vibration of wholeness. What is it like right now to sit here and try this like a meditation? Nothing wrong with you. Nothing wrong with anyone. Nothing wrong with anything. Just feel that for a moment. The only risk of doing an exercise like this is becoming aware of when nothing is wrong, your ego has no purpose. And that's where we find out the, where the glue is. Oh, I have been trained to think something's wrong with the world because that gives me a sense of purpose, that I'm here to do something. And a lot of us don't know, how do I usher in positive change if there's not the opposite to overcome? But in the dimension of wholeness, we're going from one level of wholeness to a greater level of wholeness to another level of wholeness. And we don't need problems and epidemics to go from dark to light. And your ego doesn't have to be the hero that rescues other people. You can be the hero in a world of awakening heroes. And you're just here to be the announcer of well-being and the ambassador of wholeness that says whether people are feeling this or not, I'm just going to state and declare that wholeness is here. And I'm going to do it by smiling at people, sending love to people's hearts, complimenting them whether they give me the feedback I want or not. Even if it just makes them make a weird face. I go, hey, you look very beautiful today. And they go, hmm. That's literally the, the mechanism when someone's subconscious says, yeah, I'm not worthy enough to receive that. You're beautiful. <laughs> like literally, you could press mute on your TV and watch the news. And you'll see politicians talking to each other without the sound. You'll literally just watch people just go... And you're like, oh my God, that's, that's how politics got so crooked. It's just deficiency and unworthiness being masked by an abuse of power. Oh, okay. I get that. Thank you. <laughs> but we are here to simply anchor light and to watch that light manifest miracles and beauty and positive things for others. We are here to be ambassadors of wholeness. And the more you spend anchoring wholeness, the further you get away from beliefs in deficiency. And it's difficult 
because you have an entire world of people steeped in deficiency. So you wake up in the morning and there's a gravity pulling you in to deficiency. But the more you anchor wholeness, the more that gravitational force reverses itself. And instead of pulling you into the collective, it's actually pushing you away from the collective. And then you become the light that wakes up others, not the janitor taking on other people's density to clean it up for them. What is this moment like without a problem to fix? What is this moment like when there's nothing to further clarify? What is this moment like when there's nothing to do, no one to become, but to just have the right to enjoy being you. Feel that. Ah, you see? You feel the energy. You feel that. Ah, that's lovely. And we just learn to spend more and more time in this dimensional alignment. Feel it. Ah. And then the, the innocent, beautiful voice of the ego says, well, well, what do I do? What we're already doing, this. How do I know when it will be time to stop doing this? When that time comes. See, the ego wants to just perceive this as a problem so it can prepare for the next thing to rescue. Ultimately, your ego is still having a power struggle with your soul because it perceives you as someone who needs to be rescued. And when you awaken in consciousness, what you awaken to is the realization that you don't need to be rescued. Because you are the solution that incarnated to answer all of the world's prayers. You are the solution, not the problem. What does it feel like if we sat here as someone who doesn't need to be rescued. Try these words out loud. What if, what if I, do, I didn't need any more than I already have? Right? Horrifying to your ego. <laughs> Horrifying. Horrifying. What if I didn't need any more than I already have? What if, I could just spend time what if I could just spend time embracing how whole I am? And that the areas of life that bother me might just show where more positive change is needed. But when I change, when I change it's not reaching out for better or more. actually releasing my need for the things that I so desperately want and just cleaning up the messes from what's been overlooked in various parts of my life. I don't need to go outside of myself to change. And that's why the ego resists it. Because it doesn't have a role in it. And that's okay. I love my ego. It will always have a purpose. But it's little dance. Of going outside of me. Imagining other things will make me feel better. Is done. It's been done. It's been done. It, didn't it didn't work. It's never worked. It's never worked. And, it's work. and it's not going to work. And if it, and if it wants to have a problem with that, it certainly can. I'm just going to love it. 
so that it can feel safe enough, so feel safe enough to let go. Feel this moment. Thank you, by the way. Feel this moment. What is this moment like? No problem to fix. And nothing more is needed. Nothing more is needed. In every single moment, everything you need in order to be and exist in this moment has already been put together in a energetic care package that shows up in your reality as your breath. It's totally okay to want. Want is totally fine. But maturity is honoring your wants and being aware that it might not be what you need. Because if you needed what you want, you'd already have it. And the ego goes, wonk, wonk, wonk. <laughs> First of all, can you actually desire what you already have? Like right now, try desiring you. <laughs> Not too hard, you're gonna hurt yourself. <laughs> You might throw your back out because you realize you cannot desire you. Why? Why can't you desire you? Because you're already here. You can only desire things you don't think are here. And it's manifested out of your wholeness. You tear a little bit of your wholeness out because you're going to manifest a different object it's called something you don't have. You're going to wad it up and you're going to throw it into the future so you have something to chase after. And then you go, why do I feel so deficient? Because you tore a piece of your wholeness, you molded it into something you don't have, you threw it into the future, and now you're chasing yourself. <laughs> there are many beautiful things we're all going to manifest, but not when you want to manifest it. Because usually, when you want something... That's the intuitive remembrance that that's already going to happen in the future sometime. But now you're on a journey of maturity to make sure you have the worthiness to handle receiving what you're going towards. You're already going towards it. You just have to deal with not having it yet. And if you can find complete happiness and freedom without what you want, you will then develop the maturity to handle having what you want. Why is that true? Because what you wind up receiving that you want will one day change, dissolve, erode, and go away. And if that's going to be what defines you, here comes another crisis when it goes. So this is life making us more mature. And you will one day look back in a moment of profound clarity and maturity and say, thank you, God, for not giving me what I wanted when I wanted it. Like, I'm in a position in my career where things, revolutionary, amazing things are happening for me. There are certain things that I will be announcing in the next couple of weeks I can't even publicly talk about. Like, literally, I got a memo saying, by the way, you can't talk about this. That's how there is something so big happening in my reality on a professional level. I can't wait to shout it from the rooftops. Can't talk about it right now. Literally, contractually obligated, can't talk about it. It's amazing. And yet, what's happening in my career as a lot of you have seen, my popularity, the videos, all these different things. It's expanding very rapidly, and this is the tip of the iceberg of what's about to happen. I wanted this for so many years. I knew my job was to put my head down and do the work. And I love doing the work, and that's why every time I come to you, it's a different energy, a different teaching. It's, it's always evolving. But I look at my life and I go, holy shit, thank God. I didn't get what I wanted when I really wanted it a few years ago. Thank God. Thank God. It's like your inner five-year-old putting on your parents' professional outfit or shoes and going, I'm ready to go to the office. <laughs> no, honey, you're not. 
right? You slip on your father's fireman boots, I'm ready to go fight some fires. No, you're not. You're not. And we don't get what we want because life says to give you what you want before you're ready to have it and receive it is cruel. And when you're in your ego, you think not having what you want at the speed you want it is cruel. That's how backwards we think. It's merciful. It's merciful. Try these words out loud. There's a very good reason why I don't have what I want. And it's not because of any deficiency. There's nothing wrong with my vibration. My chakras are beautiful. My energy is spectacular. And my ego will do what it's going to do. I don't have what I want. Because sometimes not having it. Is what guarantees greater maturity. So even though it's okay that I want it. I accept there's a good reason why I don't have it. And if I can find happiness and wholeness without it, there will only be happiness and wholeness with it. And if I cannot find happiness and wholeness without it, every moment with it will be anything but happiness and wholeness. So that's why I don't have what I want. You want to know an interesting way to talk about awakening? Just to, just to give different flavor to what I'm saying? Awakening is either the gradual or spontaneous disappearance of your wanter. <laughs> it's like you go about your life and then you, you stop and you go, oh my God, I think I forgot to stop and want things. Do you know what you call the rhythm of consciousness when you're just in the moment forgetting to want something different? It's called being in the flow. And you know why a lot of people want to be in the flow, but they're not? Because they're weighed down by the density of wanting. And most people will want, and then, God forbid, they get what they want soon thereafter. And then what happens? Their wanting just changes position changes perspective and goes, oh, I have that now. What about this area of my life? The wanting is never extinguished by having. And wanting only knows how to want. And all wants have to be the dire necessity of exactly what you don't have. I remember when I started to deconstruct this and I didn't have a teacher in human form. I had a universe talking to me and I then at a certain point in my journey became my own teacher, which is a very hard thing to do. And I remember deconstructing this and I remember going, everything I've ever wanted in my life, and there's nothing wrong with my wants, are always things that I don't think are happening right now. And then I look to the future as if that's where it's going to come from. And I have to start running towards it. And then one day you wake up out of that. Try these words out loud. What would this moment be like if I forgot what I wanted? And we're all smiling. You know what's a great metaphor for this? There are kids that innocently line up with their endless demands of wants when they meet Santa Claus. Most kids in line are having meltdowns. 
Most kids aren't going to Santa saying, by the way, Santa, I just wanted to thank you for what you brought me last year. <laughs> it's really been amazing, and I'm so fulfilled by all the video games and everything you bought me. Maybe this year you can maybe just make a donation in my name. What you watched is the nuclear meltdown, because children are just amplified reflections of what goes on so subtly inside all of us. And we watch kids who are fed by the hope that something better is going to happen in the future, which it always does. That's why, that's why we're drawn to that. But these endless desires just create a state of deficiency. What if I lost sight of what I wanted? Here's an even better inquiry. What is this moment like with nothing to want? When you enter into a moment where there's nothing to want, do you know what you instantly become? Closer to, to your most conscious, loving, and diplomatic self, which is the ability to meet everyone where they're at and always respond consciously, no matter how others behave. Diplomacy says other people can be however they're going to be. I abide by the code of my ethics. And when you are fed by and fueled by the desire for more or different, then other people's behavior causes you to meet them in that exact behavior. And the justification is they started it. And no matter how enlightened you are, you go from enlightenment to being 10 again. They started it. And what gets us out of that is taking a break or a permanent vacation from deficiency. You're going to have everything that you want. And matter of fact, I can actually guarantee you that you're actually going to have more than you ever wanted. And you're going to have things that are going to be so fulfilling to you that you never could have wanted. Desire is what reminds you of what is somewhere up ahead waiting for you. Desire is not what makes things come to you. If desire made things come to you, don't you think you'd have what you'd want by now? I mean, it's on its way, but how long is it taking? <laughs> and if what you've desired hasn't shown up now, why continue desiring it? And then you'll find the fear of, I'm afraid if I stop desiring it, it's not going to show up. But it hasn't shown up anyway. <laughs> what if you... Right now, and this might be seem a little radical for some people, what if you surrendered desire? I mean, let's, let's make this really interesting. How do you know what you need if you don't take a break from what you want? That's maturity. How do you know what you need unless you take a break from what you want? Most people, if they take one second break from what they want, they have no idea who they are and they freak out. Ooh, who am I? What is this? What is this? Who's tricking me? Who's tricking you? Tricking you with a moment of sanity? What would a conversation be like if it didn't involve what you want. It would be a conversation where you would hold space and be in service to others. And when two people take turns holding space and being in service to the other, we, f we call that harmony. Set down desire and see what you feel. Because ultimately, there are some of us 
that get pretty close to awakening and what's and what freaks us out is we're afraid to we're afraid to be beyond desire and the reason we surrender desire is because desire is not a tool you possess desire is not the code that helps you hack into the mainframe of the universe Desire is actually the very breath you breathe. Desire is the energy you're molded out of. You came to life out of the universe's desire to know itself as you. You are the living reality of the universe's desire to know itself and to live and to grow as only you can grow. You are already the living fulfillment of the universe's desire. Waking up out of a little dream called what different things you want. A friend called me up once because, hey, Matt, your birthday's coming up. This is a while ago. Well, what do you want? And I said, well, let me look at what I don't have and I'll send you a list. <laughs> and I was joking and I wasn't. Because that's what desire is. Let me look at what I don't have and let me tell myself that only when I have it will I feel better. That's a dream, a fantasy. And you wake up out of that real quick. I'm not saying it's wrong to desire. I'm, not, I'm just saying, what if it's not necessary? What if it's not necessary to desire? Like it's necessary to breathe. It's not necessary to desire. People who don't in any moment always have something to desire, do you know what they feel? Whole. Complete. You can literally enter into the dimension of wholeness and completion, completion right now. And the only thing separating you from your true immaculate perfection is how tightly you grip to desire. Oh, no, I can't let go of that. No, 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 no. No, because if I let go of that, the things I want aren't going to show up. But they haven't shown up yet anyway. <laughs> but if I let it go, it's really not going to show up. <laughs> you mean like right now? Let's say you let go of desire and the things you've wanted don't show up. Does that mean you can't be happy? You, what if you don't get what you want? What, what if you don't? See, in one level of reality, if we're talking about third dimensional reality, what people come into and wake up out of. We have a journey called inspiration, where everyone has the right to dream bigger than their reality. And in that dimension, that is a very inspirational way to get people into a bigger framework of inspiration and passion. But when you're waking up, it's not that that's like uncool or, oh God, you desire, how, th how 3D of you. But what happens is, is you go, yeah, I could dream, have a dream and I can fulfill it. I could go, oh my God, what the world really needs is another flower shop. <laughs> and I'm going to be a florist. <laughs> That's what I need. That's what's been eluding me my entire life. I need to buy flowers. Or whatever you tell yourself. But when you wake up. What switches is instead of thinking you always have a dream to fulfill, to, fe to feel empowered, you actually realize that your very existence is the dream come true of the universe's desire. That you are not someone whose desire needs to be fulfilled in order to be complete. Your wholeness is realizing you are the living fulfillment of life's greatest desire. And that's the shift. It's not, I have a desire. It's, 
I am what all of existence desired to be. There's your life purpose. Feel that. Imagine the universe, God, source, whatever you want to call it, light, consciousness, whatever, had experienced the life and times of all lifetimes before you and it said to itself, I want to be what's never been fathomed or comprehended and you are what satisfied that desire. It said, let me be as I've never been before. And out of the God machine came you. <laughs> whose only distraction from that incomprehensible life purpose was trying to make sure that your happiness was fulfilled by things other than you. If you're not happy being you, it just means you haven't spent enough time getting to know who you are. It's just like the words our parent taught us, you know? Oh, hi, Matthew, how was school today? Oh, there's this kid I didn't know. And what do they say? get to know them. You might be friends. Because what's the rule in the universe? The more you befriend something, the more you create a relationship and connection with it. When you don't like something, it's because you don't know it. Dislike means I judge the appearance or the behavior of something I haven't gotten to know. And the game of unconsciousness is I will be cruel and I will be ruthless and I'll be short-sighted to keep you from getting to know me. So I can play out this game of believing that no one likes me. And the minute we as consciousness, as long as we're in safe environments not being abused, go, hmm, I'm going to get to know that. What's that like? And you get interested in building relationships with the hearts and innocence of others, no matter the game they're playing with themselves. You will start waking up human beings, and you will be the first one awakening in your presence. You just have to realize you are the creation of desire, not someone waiting for the things you desire. And again, what you desire is going to show up at a certain point. And by the time it does, and when you're ready to handle it, it won't be such an intense necessity. And that's when you're ready to handle it. And in order to signal to the universe that you're ready for what you want, we have to demonstrate the boldness of spiritual maturity by taking our wanting mechanism and setting it down and asking ourselves, not only what is it like to not be the problem and to have no problem, what is it like if I just set aside what I want? And you'll feel that when you set aside what you want, you instantly become more open and heart-centered. And you realize the more time you spend putting your desires aside, not that they're not wonderful, you become more of your most mature self, which is actually the point of life. If having what you wanted made you the most mature you, you'd already have it. But oftentimes what makes us more mature is the time we spend not having what we insist on needing. And that's when life goes, oh, you don't need that. You just want that. And we're going to keep it from you so you can realize that too.
try these fun words. It's okay to want what I want. It just has nothing to do with what I need. What I need has already been given. It's here right now. I'm incapable of desiring it because it's not somewhere else needing to come closer. What I need is already within me. And if I, if I make friends with what's within me, without falling for the fear of missing out, I will start to become my most mature self, dwelling in the dimension of wholeness, no longer living in a dying planet of deficiency. And if I think having a desire or even attracting my desire feels amazing, I won't believe how outrageous it will be when I dare to set desire aside. Just feel. Here's something very interesting that you may notice. Those that are the most entrenched or attached to desire are the people that are the most willing to go to war with themselves and other people. If you're too attached, now again, having a desire isn't wrong. It's just when that kind of runs your life, you know, and you wake up in the morning, you go, oh, what I want isn't here yet. This day sucks. <laughs> Maybe the instant assessment, right? You go to your mailbox, you open it up. No, lotter, no uh, publisher's clearinghouse check. <laughs> so I'm not saying having a desire is wrong. I'm saying how attached to desire are you? People that are attached to desire are territorial, are prideful, are righteous, and they will go to war over anything. Do you know why adults wearing different team jerseys beat each other up in the stands? out of their desire for their team to win. <laughs> oh, you're wearing the other jersey and they're up 10 points. And that reminds me that my team's gonna lose and I don't like that. So I can't control the players. I could fight you. <sighs> right, adults. Fighting like children. Don't you wish you could just pause that and just wake up one person in the middle of a fight and just talk to them? Like, as their angel. Like, dude, you're a stockbroker. You're a grown-ass adult. Instantly thinking people wearing the same jersey are your friends and people wearing the other jersey are your enemies. What is that? What is that? But I'm just, and I'm not making again. Sports are, is wonderful. I think sports is fun. I think competition is fun because competition is really we compete with our own greatness. We all work together to bring the best out of each other. But when we are so entrenched in desire, we are the most willing to fight. You ever see the footage of like? Black Friday, right? The door open, the brand new iPhone or the, you know, the, I don't know, the, the wedding dresses are half off or whatever. The, whatever the, and then people are fighting each other because desire, when untamed by the light of consciousness, 
when desire is running you unconsciously, you are a fight waiting to happen. And that's why a lot of energetically sensitive beings feel unsafe in the world. Because they walk around not knowing, oh my God, I'm literally like a fight waiting to happen. And it's my relationship with desire that is literally looking for some conflict to bring into my field. That's why you're afraid, because you're not actually safe yet. You're safe once you actually put desire down. Doesn't mean you're not going to pick it back up, but you're going to just develop a more mature relationship with it. And as soon as you have a mature relationship with desire, you're no longer a fight waiting to happen. And then you feel safer in the world. Because you're, you're not walking around like this landmine someone's going to set off. And magically, when you have a healthy relationship with desire, you don't feel threatened by people. Because people that act the most scary are people who are acting out the unfulfillment of their desires. By being undesirable. To just even set down desire, the need for desire. Again, desire is wonderful. We just set it down so we have a conscious relationship with it. So it's not running us unconsciously. You do that and you have just successfully done what 90% of this planet would never have the audacity to do. And that's why most of the world is in an internal and external conflict. Whether it's countries at war, different parts of a political party, or all these different things. People disagreeing on Facebook, hiding behind their keyboards. It's all because people are run by their desires. Instead of being the source of your desires and remembering that you are what an incomprehensible loving force of consciousness desired being and form. You are what life desired. And that's the remembrance of awakening. Try these words out loud. I don't have to get what I want in order to be desirable. I am desirable exactly as I am. And if I don't believe that, it's because I haven't spent enough time with myself. Maybe I've spent time with myself picking myself apart through moments of deficiency. What's wrong with me? Do people like me? Why don't they like me? But if I can spend time with my wholeness, which is setting down desire, putting aside problems, surrendering the need to be rescued, having no one else to rescue, then I will meet myself as I truly am. As that which life desired being. And without an attachment to making things I don't have appear. That's the moment I will make my first choice. Because a choice is selecting an option. To care for the body. And to give it what it needs. But how can I know what I need if I'm too blinded by what I want to be different? When you see a Buddha statue sitting in lotus position, What is it depicting? What happens to human consciousness when you forget to want? Do you know why you can be 
seduced by the beauty of a sunrise, you only can allow that moment of inspiration to occur when you suddenly somehow forget what to want. You can't look at a sunrise and want it. I want that sunrise. You can't want it. It's already here. Have you ever like had a moment of authentic gratitude? Not, not the game of like, I'm going to be grateful every day and then life's going to give me all my treats. <laughs> like life's smart. Life knows what you're doing. <laughs> because you're life and you can't fool you, but we try to. We're trying to fool ourselves. I'm going to wake up every day and I'm going to, I'm going to, right? And we, whatever it is, like I'm, I'm going to take a 30 day gratitude challenge and I'm going to be grateful every single day. I'm not going to miss it. Nope, I won't. I sure won't. I'm going to take a 30 day gratitude challenge and I'm going to raise my vibration so big and high. God's going to be so fucking impressed with me <laughs> and say, unload the armor truck of money. For they are impressive. We have never in the history of 30-day challenges ever seen a human being challenge themselves to this degree. Unload the money. Is that how we think this shit works? Because it doesn't. But no disrespect to anyone else who does what they do. I love marketing and stuff because we're just sharing what's available. And I am in marketing meetings with publishers and stuff all the time, and I have to kind of rein things in a lot. <laughs> Matt, what if you did a 30-day challenge? They always love that. No, I'm not doing that. Because if I say that, I'm going to laugh at myself as I'm saying it so that you understand how conscious I am. Matt, a 30-day challenge, Matt. 30-day challenge. As if, and again, here's the thing, positive change, when I talk about conscious, becoming conscious is the willingness to change. Remember, I said the willingness to change without a guarantee of what you want. A lot of people who are establishing spiritual egos are trying to do the, the right changes, but for the wrong reasons. They go, oh, I'm going to do this, and life's going to then give me what I want. No, no, no. Like, a gratitude challenge is amazing just to challenge you to spend more time in wholeness and to spend less time in deficiency. That's already the gift. One thing doesn't lead to the other. <coughs> so, just feel that. Imagine wanting to be grateful. Because you realize that you are what life desired being. That the life was a party and life couldn't stand having a party without your attendance. And you were created into this moment to be present for this unfolding of global awakening. Even when it's not manufactured, it drops in naturally. You ever had a moment of authentic gratitude where you're just like overcome with joy and gratitude? Do you know why that just drops in randomly? During a moment that you forgot to want something. A moment where the clouds part and the sound of God's voice comes and angels and we have chosen you for a journey. <laughs> You've been selected for the special mission that only you can fulfill. Do you know why you hear that download? Because you forgot to want something else. And the minute you forget to want something else, you instantly become what life always wanted. Which is just a chance in time to be you. Every moment of your life, life is loving being you. Even when you do things that you hate that you do, life goes, God, I love it when you do that. <laughs> oh, oh, look. 
Oh, your tire is flat. Come on, get out of the car, do your little dance. <laughs> do your little dance, stomp around. <laughs> Say it's not fair. We love it when you do that. <laughs> we love that. Oh. Life is so liberated, it's crazy. Life loves. Imagine life's greatest fantasy. What makes life the happiest is being you. At your best, at your worst, is the same joy for life. Life wants nowhere else to be but with you. And when you are attached to desire, you always want to be anywhere other than where you're at. That's the conflict. That's the conflict. And what's amazing when we put desire down is it changes the way you think. And what I'm about to say, I've never taught before, like I always do with my teachings. I don't usually talk about how awakening changes how you think. But what's interesting is that most people, before they wake up, think that they've spent their life having thoughts about a variety of things. But what most people don't know is that prior to awakening, you mostly haven't actually thought about anything that you think you were thinking about. You are only thinking about those things and how it relates to you, which means most of our lives, we've been thinking about ourselves and imagining it's about other things. And as soon as you set down desire, what happens is, you don't always have to be the center of attention for yourself or for others. And as soon as you don't always have to be the center of attention, as soon as a moment doesn't have to be, what about me? Then all of a sudden, beauty is everywhere. Inspiration flows. Abundance is your natural state, not an award you get for good behavior. And you realize, oh my God, I don't think I've even thought about anything other than myself my entire life. And do you know what happens when you spend your entire life thinking about you? You make you into the problem that you have to fix. And tonight is the end of that. Doesn't mean you can't be the focus. It means you don't have to be the focus. Do you feel the difference in that? Like someone can go, hey, you look beautiful. Hey, thanks, I appreciate it. You can be the focus, but you don't have to be the focus. It doesn't always have to be about you. And do you know what life does to get you used to it not always being about you? It masquerades as other people who have a lot more to say and causes you to have to listen and listen. Oh my God, how much are they gonna say? Oh my God, when are they gonna ask about me? What about me? Hey, I'm over here, I'm interesting, why don't you ask about me? Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and that's life trying to get you over yourself. <laughs> Matt, my, the people in my life don't listen. Well, maybe there's a good reason for that. <laughs> They don't ask about me. No, 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 no. They're, 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 they're playing their roles perfectly. <laughs> Why can't they ask about me? Because that's where most of us live our entire lives. Is it only being about you? And that's when your happiness is only in future pending moments where what you don't have somehow magically appears and you're the most willing to go to war with any amount of differences in other people because you are the unconscious product of your desires instead of being that which life has desired. The moment you become aware of either the sensation, the feeling, or the sound of your breath, you confirm 
that the moment isn't at that moment about you. And if we spend more time breathing, we find ourselves having less of an unconscious relationship with our desires. And we find ourselves feeling safer in the world because we're not walking around as a battle waiting to explode. Just feel. Feel how expanded this light is right now. This is the light of your true nature. This is what is within your body watching and feeling everything you watch and feel. This is, this is what awakening shows you, that this is you, this feeling. This is you. And it's a level of maturity that says, it's okay if people make it about me. It doesn't always have to be about me. Life doesn't always have to be about what I want. But life is always a journey of giving me what I need. And that's why we say thank you. <laughs>